We're all tied up here in the ninth. Two and two is the count. Two outs and a man on third. The pressure is on for these young men. They've all worked so hard for this moment. One run is all they need to win it all. Good morning, Eastern Hills. It is great to be with you guys. I have been here since Thursday night. I had the pleasure of joining the women of Eastern Hills uh, for their retreat this weekend, and we had a great time. I personally love Colorado. I was trying to remember how many times I have been to the Denver area, and if I've counted correctly, I'm at about 10. I'm somewhere around 10. Yes, I live in Woodstock, Georgia, but uh, Denver and the mountains, they are dear to me. So uh, like Lisa said, my husband, Tony, we have entered this new season of life because we say we're empty nesters, but our 21-year-old still lives with us, but he's more like a roommate at this point. <laughs> he works about 45 to 50 hours a week, and so a lot of times he'll leave before I even get up, and then we don't know what time he gets home. We just see his headlights come in maybe, and you know, we're like, hey, how you doing? Great, and he informed us uh, about a year ago, he was gonna take Life360 off of his phone. Now keep in mind, he's 21 years old. Yes, he lives at home, but he pays for his own cell phone. Can I get an amen for that? And so I thought, you know what? You pay for your own cell phone? I guess you can take uh, Life360 off your phone. So anyway, we are loving this season, and um, I really think that I was created to be a parent of adult children. Like, I am thriving in this season of parenting because guess what, I'm not actively parenting anymore. We have two kids, Mary Beth is 24, and she lives in Atlanta, so I say I'm from Atlanta, but we're 45 minutes northwest of there, but my daughter, like, she's in Atlanta, so we kind of joke, like you get off at the Jimmy Carter Boulevard exit and you take a left and she's right there and they've got all these awesome walkways and she can walk there and it's awesome. She's living her best young adult life. And like I said, Davis still lives with us and we are thriving in this season as parents. But I've got to say that has not always been true about every season of parenting. And for us, and maybe for some of you, the most difficult season of parenting was when they were teenagers. And so if, if you have teenagers, if you have raised teenagers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If your kids are not yet teenagers, they're gonna be great. It's gonna be fun, it's gonna be awesome, okay? It's gonna be so, so great. So, um, but for us, this is the exception. <laughs> For us, teenage years were really hard. And we went through a pretty difficult season with our son Davis. And you know, for both of our kids, they're wired completely differently. And they both have their strengths and their weaknesses and their challenges. And so for Davis, that difficult season for us hit when he was 15 years old. And our daughter, Mary Beth, was already off at college. And so uh, we were at home, Tony, Davis, and me. And it was a really difficult, dark season for our family and as parents. And so we got Davis into counseling, and he's super open about all of this. And so um, he gives me permission to talk about it. And um, so it was really difficult. We found him a counselor. His counselor is amazing. Davis, once his counselor released him from counseling, he said, can I still come see you though? Because <laughs> this counselor is just really cool. And so he still sees him periodically to check in. And so there was one session where his counselor had us come in 
with him. Normally, he met with Davis by himself. And so we would do kind of these periodic family check-ins. And so this one session, we're there, and Jordan has figured out, he already knew this, but he's a professional, and um, he's figured out that I tend to be the disciplinarian, the strict parent, okay? Tony, he tends to be the compassionate one, the sensitive one, the fun parent. But, I mean, that makes sense for Davis because he and Davis have way more in common than Davis and I do, right? Like, I'm his mom. I just naturally have more things in common with my daughter. We're wired very similarly. And so it came more easily to my husband, Tony, to be able to relate to Davis in a fun way. And so we're sitting in his counselor's office and Jordan looks at me and he says, Alicia, you need to have more fun with Davis. And then he looks at Tony and says, you need to be more strict with Davis. Y'all, I'm an Enneagram 7. You tell me that I need to have more fun, and I'm like, game on. So we leave that office, and Davis had been saying for a while that he had wanted to learn how to snowboard. This child, he thinks he can do anything. (laughs) We went over the top with the self-confidence on this one, okay? So he thinks he can do anything, and he has, have you guys ever seen the ripstick skateboards where it's one wheel in the front and one wheel in the back, and when it's not upright, it just naturally lays on its side. Like, this thing is ridiculous, but he got one, and he learned how to ride it, and so he's like, hey, I can snowboard. Like, You've never been to a mountain. What do you mean you can snowboard? So anyway, so when Jordan says you need to have fun, I take that as direction because I'm a rule follower. My husband is a rule follower. And so I go home and I'm talking to Tony and I said, so, you know, you heard what Jordan said and I need to have fun with Davis. So what would you think about me taking Davis snowboarding in Breckenridge in three weeks? Tony goes, I think that's a great idea. Y'all, my husband is not spontaneous. So the fact that he looked at me and said, I think that's a great idea. I think that was divine intervention, okay? So the reason why I wanted to go to Breckenridge is because I have incredible memories with my own dad where he and I took a few ski trips out to Breck uh, when I was in college, just the two of us. I have sisters, my mom, but for whatever reason, this was something that my dad and I did, just the two of us. And so I thought, if I have a direction from a professional that I need to connect with my son, he wants to go snowboarding to show that he already knows how to, (laughs) we're gonna go, and we're gonna go to Breckenridge. It was really awkward. I mean, I'm with my 15-year-old son. We're kind of distant right now in our relationship, and so it's just the two of us. We have a lot of time together. And it was just awkward. And the first day we go out on the slope and I say, you know what, I'm a cool mom. I know how to ski, but I'm gonna learn how to snowboard in my 40s. It's gonna be great. (laughs) You know where this is going. And so we go to ski school and they're teaching us. Davis got up the first time. I'm like, are you kidding me? So he learns how to snowboard. He's off by himself with his own instructor because nobody else is able to keep up with them, so they go off. So my big plan of us having fun together, he's off on his own. I'm like, cool, cool. So the first time I get off the ski lift with the snowboard, I tore my meniscus. But don't you worry, I snowboarded the rest of that trip. I did not turn in my snowboard. Now, the next time we came back, I got my skis because I wanted to be able to spend time with my son, okay? So Tony, uh, Davis just didn't know that the price of admission to go on a ski or snowboard trip with his mom is that he has to take the selfies with me, okay? If you have teenagers, you know they do not like for you to take pictures of them. They will take pictures of themselves all day long. 
all day long. But if I wanna take a picture, oh no, we're not taking a picture. But on this trip, I think Davis was wise enough to say, hey, my mom is finally taking me on the snowboard trip that I've been wanting to do, so I'm just gonna give in and I'm gonna take a selfie. So here's what it looked like. <laughs> we're starting in the airport. Now, what's really funny about this, this was our third trip to Breckenridge. Like, he's just totally given up at this point, but he's also not even pretending. And you guys can't see the date on there, but that's February of 2020. Like, this is ignorant bliss, right? So, yeah, so that's, that's in the airport as we're getting ready to board the flight. And, oh, can we go back just for a second? Because I've got to read to you the caption. It says, his favorite thing about traveling with his mom is definitely the selfies. Okay, so the next one, <laughs> he looks thrilled, doesn't he? He's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this to you. And my hashtag is selfies with mom. And then the next one, yeah, we can't even see the look on his face, but I am sure he is just thrilled. But you can see my camera and my goggles, right? And then we had such a great time on this trip that he finally was willing to actually pose for one. And so this is the last picture from that trip. Last day, best day, hashtag not a selfie. <laughs> so as a mom, I take pictures with my kids. I wanna take the pictures because I know we're not going to remember this moment forever. I wanna capture the moment. And capturing the moment is a really good thing. We do this all the time. We take pictures, we take pictures of food. We wanna capture just how amazing the plating is at this restaurant, right? We take pictures when we get together with friends who we haven't seen in a while because we want documentation that we actually went out with our friends and we had a great time. We take pictures on vacations because we want to capture the moment. We take the picture because we don't want to forget, right? We take the picture whether our teenagers want us to or not so that we can remember. So we're in this series, the bottom of the ninth, and Kendall kicked it off last week that this idea of the bottom of the ninth is really about hope. That when you're down and you think you're out, you're actually not out. You feel like you're out, and maybe you're in that season right now. You feel like you're out. Maybe it's with your finances. Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe your career is not going the way that you thought it would, and you feel like you're out. But if you're not in a season of the bottom of the ninth, if you would say, you know what, that's not me. Things are actually going pretty well. I'm content with where we're at right now. Today's for you too. Today is gonna be an all skate. Today is for everyone because today is about preparing for that moment when you will be in the bottom of the ninth because we're adults, right? We've lived life. We have experienced seasons where it was difficult, but we've also hopefully experienced seasons where things were going well. This idea of the bottom of the ninth, it means you're in the dark. This bottom of the ninth moment, the darkness, it can feel depressing, it can feel defeating, it can feel hopeless. But like I said, there's not just darkness, we also experience light, and even if you're in a season of darkness right now, you have probably experienced light. Do you remember that time that you really wanted to ask that person out and you finally got the courage and they said yes? You're like, yeah. Or you asked that person out and they said no. And looking back, you realize you dodged a bullet with that one, right? <laughs> that is a moment of light. Or you really wanted that house and you made offer after offer after offer, 
and they finally accepted the offer. That's a moment of light. You are waiting on that call from your doctor and they called and said, guess what? The test came back clear. Or maybe for you, you went through the darkest season of your life and some way, somehow, you have gotten on the other side of it. That is a moment of light. And the reality is, light is so important. It is so important for us to remember those moments of light. Because in the dark, we need to be able to remember the moments of light. We tend to doubt in the dark, right? Think about when you were a kid or maybe with your own kids. You'd have your nighttime routine, you'd get put to bed, everything's good, your parents kiss you goodnight, and they're like, hey, we'll see you in the morning, and they walk out and flip the light switch, close the door, and all of a sudden, everything in your room has changed form, the thing over there is now a ghost, you've got monsters in the closet, Monster Inc. did not help that situation, you've got spiders crawling on your ceiling, you can't take it anymore, and you call for mom, and she comes running, she turns on the light, it's like, oh, I'm all good. I'm all good. Everything's good in the light. But as soon as we're in the dark, we begin to doubt, don't we? To be ready for those bottom of the ninth moments, we need to be able to remember the moments of light. The same is true in our relationship with God. When we're in the dark, we forget what God did for us in the light. Do you have moments where you look back and you can say, God was faithful. He was faithful in that moment. God came through. But when we're in the dark, we really struggle to remember what God did for us to break through that fog and to get us back to the light. We certainly remember what he didn't do when we're in the dark. We remember what he hasn't done yet. We can't remember, so we doubt. In the dark, we focus on God's failures and not his faithfulness. And when we're in the light, we have a tendency to take credit for all the good, right? Oh, that's on me. I did that. We even take credit for the things that God actually did on our behalf. But when we're in the dark, we have a tendency to blame God for everything. Even the decisions that we made that got us into that situation in the first place. But when we're in the dark, we're not taking responsibility for any of it. It's all God's fault. You see, dark and light, they are connected. And if we prepare when we are in the moment of light, then maybe we don't have to doubt when we're in the dark. The light can actually bring hope to the dark. The light can bring hope to the dark only when we choose to remember what happened in the light. So today, we're going to look at a story of people who constantly forgot what God had done for them in those moments of light. And this story is in the book of Exodus. I'm gonna, um, we're gonna back up for a second to set the stage for what we're actually gonna unpack today. And so this story, uh, starts off in Exodus, and we have the Israelites. And if you know anything about the Israelite nation, they actually started from this man uh, named Abraham. And Abraham trusted God, and when he trusted God, God made a promise to Abraham. And God promised Abraham, I am going to bring you a people. I'm going to give you land, and I am going to bring through those people, through your descendants, 
I am going to bring about a worldwide blessing. There was nothing Abraham had to do for that promise to be fulfilled. And so now we fast forward and the Israelites are the descendants from Abraham. And now we find that the Israelites have been enslaved in Egypt for about 400 years. Years. You think God has taken a long time to answer your prayer? These people have been in Egypt enslaved for 400 years. But they're descendants of Abraham. And they would share stories and pass them down generation after generation. And they knew that God had promised Abraham. They didn't know what that was going to look like. They didn't know when it was gonna happen. I am confident we know they lost hope and we know that because of how they interacted with God later on and what we're gonna see today. So they've spent 400 years in slavery and then that's where we get Moses. God raises up Moses as the leader of the Israelites and at this point, God has decided this is the moment. I'm getting them out of slavery and so he has Moses go to Pharaoh. Do you remember the story? And so Moses says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. And God says, okay. And so he brings about 10 plagues. And the plagues are just weird. I mean, we can't even fully understand when we read this story in the Old Testament, I don't even think we have a concept of what actually took place. I mean, you've got gnats, you've got locusts, the livestock dies of the Egyptians, and we're just kind of separated and removed from this, right? And then the final plague was horrible. And finally, Pharaoh says, okay, you can go. And so they're leaving, and that's why we call it the Exodus, because they're exiting out of Egypt. And then what happens? They're all leaving Egypt, and they get to the Red Sea, and they're like, okay, now what? And God says, yeah, I'll show you now what. And so what does God do? So now he's just had these 10 plagues. He's gotten them out of Egypt, we're at the Red Sea, and now the Egyptians have changed their mind. They're coming behind them, and God says, yeah, I'm gonna make a way for you. And he parts the Red Sea. Remember this? So they get to the other side, and where they're going is the promised land. That land that God promised Abraham hundreds of years earlier, God is faithful And he's fulfilling that promise to Abraham. So that sets the stage for where we are. And so we're at Joshua now. They have just wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And we are gonna pick up in this story in Joshua chapter three, okay? And it starts in chapter three, verse 15. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. So this is what happened. They've wandered Egypt for 40 years and they're finally gonna get to go into the promised land. And they get up there and there's a problem. The Jordan River is flowing right in front of them between them and the promised land. And they're like, well, now what are you gonna do? And God's like, do you not trust me? So harvest season, harvest season tells us when this happened. It was probably in March or April because that was the beginning of their year, the way they kept their calendar. So it was harvest season. And where they were, Mount Heron was up and they, Mount Heron had snow. Do you guys know anything about snow? Um, I know way more about snow after this weekend. I brought flats to wear. So... (laughs) The snow is melting and it's flowing down into the Jordan River and that's creating flood season. And so they have walked up to the Jordan River during flood season and it has gotten to about 10 to 12 feet deep and it's about the width, the length of a football field to get across. So the length of the football field to get across. They are not swimming across this river that is flowing, right? So that's where we're at. And it says, yet, as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, 
while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, if we didn't know, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. So all of these details, they don't mean a lot to us, but it actually does give important information to the people who lived at the time that this was written. They know exactly where this is. And so they're at the River Jordan, and they have priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and that represented God's very existence to them. This represented God's holiness, and so the priests were the ones that would carry the ark and God had commanded them. Hey, he told Joshua, have them walk up. I am going to do what I've done before. You can trust me because I've done this before. And so they walk up and it parts. And not only does it part, but it builds a wall of water and this information where they talk about the town of Adam and there at Jericho, that tells us it's about 16 miles wide. Now, if all of this sounds so unbelievable to you, I get it. You're like, do you really believe this happened? I actually do. But if you don't, I don't want you to miss what we can learn from this story. But also the reality that we actually have documentation of earthquakes that have dammed the flow of the River Jordan. It was like 12, 1260-something this happened. Again, in 1927, this happened. In 1927, the river didn't have water running in it for about a day because of that earthquake. So I'm not telling you how. We don't know how God did it. We just know that God did it. So don't miss what we can learn from this just because this seems too unbelievable. But what we do know is that two million people crossed the Jordan River. That's how big the Israelite nation was at this point. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation, all two million of them, had completed the crossing on dry ground. This is a river during flood season, and it is dry ground. That is miraculous. But can you imagine if you were the last person of two million and you don't know how long this water is gonna be stopped? You're like, am I gonna make it? Am I gonna make it? Oh, I can't even imagine. And you know, the Israelites, they're like, oh, God finally came through for us. And God's like, finally? I finally came through? Have you forgotten all? of the things that I have done for you. I am fulfilling a promise that I made hundreds of years ago. Do you remember when I got you out of Egypt? Do you remember when I parted the Red Sea? Do you remember that in 40 years of wilderness, I guided you throughout the day by a cloud and at night by a fire, and I provided food for you every single day? And I love that you recognize that I am faithful in this moment but I want you to be able to remember that I have been faithful. I have been faithful. Then it continues. When the whole nation had finished crossing, crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So God is giving this instruction to Joshua. Joshua didn't hesitate. He's like, on it. He goes to the people and he says, so Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord. So you've got the priests who are carrying the ark of the Lord still standing in the middle of a dry riverbed. Remember, the width of this river is the length of a football field. So they're at the 50-yard line, okay? 
Go over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder. Don't go to the edge and pick up a little rock. I want you to go back into the middle of this river that is currently dry that I am holding up for you. And I want you to get a stone, a stone so big that you're putting it up on your shoulder, maybe with the help of somebody else, and you're carrying it over to where you're going to sleep tonight. According to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, 12, there were 12 tribes of Israel, they're each getting a stone, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Isn't this great? Your children, they're gonna ask you. (laughs) They're gonna ask you about this, and I want to give you a reason to tell them about it. I want you to tell generation after generation that I am faithful, that in those dark moments, I am with you. You can have hope. The thing is, God doesn't want us to doubt. He's comfortable with our doubt. He can handle our doubt. But God doesn't want you to doubt in the dark what you have learned in the light. When you're in the dark, he wants you to have something that you can point to, something that you learned in the light. So he says, in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. See, God's saying, I've been faithful. But you have a tendency to forget. You don't remember all of the things that I have done to fulfill promises. So we're gonna do it differently this time. And this time, I want you to build a memorial so that you can remember what I did in the light. So the Israelites did. They did as Joshua commanded them. And they are there to this day. So when this was written, they knew exactly what this was talking about. The Israelites learned something. They learned something powerful And whether you take this literally or believe that this really happened or not, we can learn from this story. Remembering what God did for you in the light provides hope when you find yourself in the dark. But God didn't just tell them to remember because he knows remembering is not enough. God takes remembering a step further, doesn't he? And he says, memorialize what I've done for you in the light so you can point to what he can do again when you're in the dark. So I know we're all different and there are different ways that we can create memorials to remember what God has done for us to get us through the dark seasons and bring us to the light. And so I thought I would give you a few different examples based on your personality of maybe some ideas of how you could create a memorial to remember what God has done to bring you through the dark and into the light. For you, maybe it's a place. Like for me, when I think of Breckenridge, Colorado, I think about that time and God being faithful. And I can look back and say, God was with us and I wasn't confident in that moment, but looking back, God was faithful. Maybe it's a place, maybe it's a verse for you. I have a friend who went through a cancer diagnosis and thankfully, She is on the other side of it. I have other friends where her healing, it didn't happen on this side of heaven. And in both situations, 
I can look back and I can say God was with them, God was with us, God was with her. And that verse, it's a memorial, it's a reminder that God was with them. So maybe for you it's a verse, maybe it's a person, maybe it's a child. You prayed for that child and you look at that child and that is a reminder. In the waiting, you didn't know if this was ever gonna happen and maybe it wouldn't have. But in your life, the memorial is the child that you have the privilege of raising. Maybe for you, it's an object. That's why we get souvenirs when we go on vacation, to remind us of that fun experience, to capture that moment of light. Or it could be a journal. For me, it's a journal. And I know that may seem girly to the guys in the room, but I promise you, I have gotten such great reminders from writing down so that I don't forget what God has done to bring me through the dark and get me to the light. Or maybe for you, it's a song. A lot of couples in the room, you may have a song. For me, our song is from a Dave Matthews Band song because we went to college in the 90s and that's just what you did. (laughs) But if you wanna make our time together worth it today, then you're going to memorialize what God has done for you to bring you to the light. You memorialize what God did in the light so you can point to what he can do in the dark. You can do this. It's just a matter of whether or not you will. For me, it's a journal. I am so thankful for this journal. This is the journal that I wrote in when I found out just how difficult of a season my son was in. It was September 28th, 2017. I wrote this the morning before I found out what a dark season my old son was in. I said, God, I just knew as a mom, I knew something wasn't right in my son. God, you love Davis even more than I do. I surrender my control of him to you, to the creator of the universe. Give me eyes to see as you see. Give me wisdom in parenting and give me courage to follow through. And it was that afternoon that a friend of mine came to me and she shared with me what my son had shared with her son. And our lives changed on September 28th, 2017. And I can look back and this was so dark. And I've got pages and pages after that day and y'all, I, I mean, please don't think I'm better than I am. Like, I don't write in this all the time, but I am so grateful that I have this so that when I go through dark seasons again, the dark doesn't have to be so dark. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna walk out of here and do nothing? Are you gonna take this as an opportunity to remember to memorialize what God has done in your life to bring you through those dark seasons. He can be trusted. He is faithful. Or are you gonna walk out of here and do nothing? My prayer for you is that you will memorialize what God has done for you in the light so that it doesn't have to be so dark in the bottom of the night. I'd love to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this truth. I thank you that we have evidence preserved in scripture of your faithfulness. And even though this was written for the Israelites, we get to learn about who you are. And we get to learn from the experience of the Israelites so that we don't have to doubt. 
I know you can handle our doubts. I know you can handle our questions, but that's not what you want for us. You want us to trust you. So Father, I pray that we can leave here today and we can actually put something in action to remind us that you are faithful, that you are good, that you do love us. And even though it may not work out the way we would design it to, we know that your way is best. And we get to live on this side of the resurrection. And we get to have a relationship with you through Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray, amen.